I'd like to acknowledge that we're standing on Aboriginal land, uh, land of the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation, which was stolen and never ceded. And um, actually just following on from what Jacob and, um, and Nathan have been saying, I mean, the fact that there is a discussion at the moment about treaty in Australia is a, res is a result of the movement in support of Aboriginal rights really actually coming forward in leaps and bounds over the last period because otherwise we'd just be um, discussing the um, Abbott, Shorten, Turnbull version of some sort of anemic recognition in the Constitution, which might even, um, if it was achieved, might actually extinguish the possibilities of things like treaty and so forth. Um, so <laughs> that is a tribute to the mass movement. Um, I'd um, just, I'd like to start by just um, talking a little bit about the possibilities of a Corbyn in Australia, because people, the end point of Nathan's talk, um, which was really interesting, uh, um, is about you know whether or not you know should, is that even the right kind of question. I think um, I do like the way in which um, Nathan answered that question because I think um, you know while you can't uh, you never should never say never especially as a Marxist. I mean, I think it's, um, it is quite a different context in Australia, and I think the ALP is a very different beast in Australia to Britain. Um, talking to um, Nathan, even his uh, mentioning of the fact that um, Corbyn had gone voted against the ALP, the BLP, <laughs> um, uh, over 400 times. In Australia, that has never happened. With the um, invasion of Iraq, Tony Blair had to rely on the Tories to get the um, invasion motion through because um, I think someone like 170 or 180 British Labor MPs voted against the invasion. Um, when Bob Hawke took us to war in Iraq in the early 90s, um, not a single um, Labor MP um, voted against. And in Australia, generally, the um, the only times I've seen an ALP parliamentarian break to the left and vote against the ALP, it happens very, very rarely in state or federal parliament. Um, it's usually because they've lost pre-selection, so they won't be able to run again anyway, um, or else because they're retiring and suddenly they discover a bit of bravery. So, um, and I'm not quite sure of the reason why. Maybe it's because we've got a s smaller... Um, socialist movement and, and mass movement possibly. To understand um, the way the factional system works in Australia is very different. So, I mean, it's not to, you never can say never, but I think it is quite a different scenario. And I must admit, you know, looking at the Greens and their lack of genuine connection to the mass movement, I really can't see it there. And I think really um, the critical thing is, rather than necessarily focusing on who's going to be the Corbyn. <laughs> um, I think what we have to do is we have to create one too many Corbyns. Um, and really the only way we can do that is through really trying to build popular resistance because uh, the struggle throws up leaders um, th through the whole dynamics of struggle. And I think that is the most critical thing because I imagine um, that for Corbyn to have taken the stances he's taken, he must have quite um, close connection with the mass movement. Um, and I think that is the key thing. So the stronger the resistance is, the stronger the mass movement is, and the popular movement, the more likely it is that anyone who gets elected, a socialist who gets elected, will pursue a radical socialist agenda and doesn't get co-opted. Because the pressures to be co-opted are intense. It's very, very, very strong. Um, um, I mean, I, you know, I certainly argue, Socialist Alliance argues, that it is very important for the left, the socialist movement, to participate in the electoral sphere while also building the mass movement. And we know there's some, a lot of socialist groups in Australia don't agree with that. Um, but we've seen both through our own experiences through local council, but also looking at experiences in other, other countries that if the left um, is elected on a principal basis, if it's got close connection to the mass movement um, and those elected um, members are accountable 
to the movement and to the party membership, that it can, um, it can be a way of helping trigger and, and develop, um, develop the struggle uh, further. But there's also um, a lot of pressures to do the opposite of that as well, which we saw with Syriza. Um, and also in Australia, we've seen that with various left independents and, and so on and so forth. Um, so you've got to have that close, a close connection. Um, I also think the importance of participating, despite you know the pressures for corruption, etc., is the inspiration people around the world have had for um, for the whole Corbyn campaign and also um, Bernie Sanders as well, because the US, <coughs> you know, when you're standing from the outside like we are, it just looks like oh, fuck, you know, <laughs> just like US politics totally fucked. How can anything? possibly happen um, that's progressive and inspiring. But like, the, so no one really expected the whole Bernie Sanders thing. And for ordinary people who don't necessarily follow the ins and outs of politics, given the media didn't cover Sanders till late in the piece, um, it sort of was like a bolt from the blue that you can have this other style of politics. And there were a lot of ordinary people, some not just activists, but um, a lot of ordinary people who were very inspired by Sanders and Corbyn. And obviously our um, role is to try and find all of those people to get them involved in, um, in the movement and, and action. Um, but um, <coughs> challenges are huge if you get elected. And, and so this is why the connection with the mass movement is important because I think when universal suffrage was won, the right to vote for everybody was run, although mind you there are still categories of people who don't have the right to vote. Um, but I, I suspect the ruling class thought, shit, you know, what are we going to do, you know, can we still um, get our project through if everyone's got the right to vote? So basically, ever since universal suffrage was won, they have developed so many techniques to try and make sure anyone who is a bit radical, a bit left, um, sticks with the program, the capitalist program that might have a slightly leftish reforming tendency, but as long as it's within a certain boundary that they don't escape. So that, you, know, their, um, you know, their techniques are wide and many from you know, the political spin, the, um, the wedge politics, the legal restrictions to try and tie you in knots between all the different levels of government, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the so-called um, politically neutral bureaucracy, um, which you know blocked every you know a lot blocked everything Chavez was trying to do in Venezuela. So they had to set up parallel a uh, parallel institutions in the social missions to um, run free education and free healthcare, etc. So it's it's um, they they put huge resources into this. And, um, and they, then they use secrecy, so they try and keep you in a club, a club of just the politicians and the bureaucrats talking to each other. I mean, at local council level, it's sort of like a um, government of national unity, so you don't have government and opposition. Um, so they try and keep, find a way of keeping everyone in a secret fold, um, where you, know, you have lots of you know, briefings behind closed doors that ordinary people are kept out of, but often outside authorities and sometimes businesses are, are allowed to participate in. And what I find is, um, in the council, the, um, there is zero, even from the Greens who bang on a lot about transparency, there is zero questioning about this secrecy. There is total defending of, um, you know, I moved a motion once that, um, Oh, I've moved it several times, never got a second day. Um, <laughs> or, um, but these secret briefings where they have people from the outside, and on a few occasions they've had companies come in, um, not often, but you know, in one case, uh, with, uh, you know, they, um, I moved a motion that they not only list in the council agenda who's attend the names of people who've attended the briefings, but the organisations they represent couldn't get a second up from the so-called transparent greens. Um, so um, who, who do talk a lot about transparency and do various things, but not about the central issues, which is about um, secrecy, keeping things secret from, from the people. So um, the only way of breaking this dead hand of the bureaucracy is to build a mass movement, to push aside the bureaucratic structures 
and to engage in the battle of ideas because, you know, basically the politicians and um, the bureaucrats behind them and the media, I mean, they're manufacturing all the time. They're trying to manufacture public opinion. So if a leftist goes into, a socialist goes into that elected space without <coughs> mass movements, then you really don't have a hope because they're busy trying to mould public opinion by presenting misinformation, slanted information, etc., etc., to people. And so people, not everyone can study politics 100% of the time. People do get conned and sucked in. Um, I think it is use, very useful to look at the differences between a socialist approach and the approach of the Greens and NGOs because I think there is still a very parliamentary consciousness in Australia, including on the left actually, even including some people, you know, even in the anarchist movement I find actually, there is quite a parliamentary consciousness about, um, you know, often social change. Um, but like you talk to the Greens and NGOs, I'd say NGOs in the same category, and you talk to them because they talk about grassroots democracy, we talk about grassroots democracy, sounds like you're talking about the same thing. But actually when you're talking to a lot of the Greens, now obviously there's some rank and file Greens who are really good activists, so I'm not saying all Greens are like this, but the general Greens party politics is like this. So when they're talking about grassroots democracy, they're not talking about the same thing at all. They're really talking about, yes, they appreciate the fact that there are some people over there, um, you know, doing various campaigns and so forth. Yes, that's good, pat you on the head. Um, but, and, and yes, they like the photo shoots where people turn out with all identical, you know, signs and identical t-shirts, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of something genuine where people are running campaigns themselves, which is the most politicising aspect, they, they're not, they, they don't even understand. Like quite often when I'm talking to them, whether it's NGO person or the Greens, they don't even understand what you're talking about. It's like you're talking in a totally different language. And I would, um, an example is also, is of the East West Link campaign in Melbourne a couple of years ago when the Greens MP Adam Band organised, he did organise several protests, which is really good that he did do that. But unlike the other wings of the campaign, the more activist wings in Yarra, which Socialist Party led, and in Moreland that we led, um, Adam Band and the Greens never tried to help people in the western end of that East West Link develop a campaign. Out of the, so those rallies were just Greens rallies. They were not genuine rallies. They were Greens rallies. And they just actually don't understand that. And probably um, something just recently when the Greens in Moreland have been particularly livid with me is over a free speech campaign. And this is where um, probably most councils, and in fact, Socialist Alliance and its forerunners in the Democratic Socialist Party have been involved in free speech campaigns all over Australia. Probably pretty much every branch has had an experience of battling council officers over trying to shut down street stalls. And, and, and so, all, so some of the councils implement these laws very strictly, some a bit more lax. So the local laws are going through Moreland Council at the moment. There's a review on. And it include things like um, that they tried to sneak in a ban on protests without a permit, but they already had in their book a ban on handbills without a permit, a ban on street stalls without a permit, a ban on busking without a permit, a ban on camping, etc. And I knew, one, as soon as I knew it was uh, definitely coming up and what was contained, I started telling everybody when it became public I called a protest. And the Greens were furious with me over this. Um, firstly saying, oh, you're saying that the um, council's proposing this. It's not proposing because we haven't voted on it. Well, it's fucking in the council reports um, <laughs> being advocated by the council bureaucrats. So maybe we haven't voted on it, but the council, wing of the council, is proposing it. Um, then one of them started yelling at me over this campaign. Then at the end of this particular meeting, this particular Greens councillor was talking to me saying, you know, how disappointed he was that I, you know, initiated this protest. Because most people wouldn't even know about these laws. And that's the problem, is people aren't aware 
that all of these things are in place, that politicians, you know, implement all sorts of things without people knowing which affect their lives. But this particular Greens councillor, who is a new one, who said, said to me, is so excited about being elected to Moreland Council, uh, over and over, excited, excited, excited. Um, and then he said he was really loved working with all the councillors and the council directors and expected to be working more closely with me, blah, blah, blah. And then I said to him, but Dale, you <coughs> miss out the most important people, the community. Um, because he's talking about working with the councillors and the council bureaucrats. I mean, he's a good enough guy, you know, nice enough person, but it's sort of, uh, I don't think it's a slip of the tongue because it's how they see it. Um, so sometimes the community does enter that picture, but generally they conceive of this um, whole process of um, change, change through <coughs> negotiation between the bureaucrats and, and the various political representatives. And I think um, maybe just one last point on the movement, another campaign we're involved in in Melbourne, which is around public housing, because over the years, in, I think it's further ahead in Victoria than other states, they've been, um, well, usually the, state, the Liberal Party just sells it off, but the Labor Party's been sneakily privatising public housing following the British model. Um, and I think the lack of... <coughs> a campaign of a strong campaign by public housing tenants is really what's let them get away with this over years. And so you even notice that ex-student lefties who now work in housing services have bought the line, hook, line and sinker, that public housing has failed and you need this new model of housing associations where people don't have the same secure, I mean they lie about the level of security and, and so forth. These housing associations house a very few people on Newstart. They won't, they won't house people on Newstart or youth allowance or homeless people because they need to accumulate capital. And, and there are a lot of, you know, quite good people who've come through universities and start working in these organisations and they've just accepted the ideology. When you, what you look at no, you're almost finished. Um, when you look at um, these particular states that are under threat in Melbourne now, what do you see? So the state emphasises social problems on the estates, well, there's social problems in private housing as well, including owner occupiers, um, <laughs> there's plenty of domestic violence and all the rest of it, drug problems, etc. Um, but what you notice with these communities is these are long term stable housing because public housing gives long-term stable tenancies. And so what you notice when you're door knocking on these estates is this is a very intact, solid community where people look after each other, look after each other's kids, etc. that they're trying to throw to the winds and disperse to the winds. And I think this is an example where the government's been able to get away with its propaganda because of the lack of a campaign around this particular issue. So I guess I'm just ending on um, this point about the critical importance of um, building that movement and then the link between that and uh, um, developing principled socialist activists who get elected and are accountable. Thanks.